Uh, I'm very, very happy that Fenna's is joining us today. Uh, I've actually been trying to get her to come give a talk for a couple of years. So uh, we finally got her. Um, and Fenna, I believe, partially grew up in Alfred part of the time. Is that, am I correct? Yes. Yes. And I'm sorry, I meant to ask you this before. Did you go to Alfred University? I did. I graduated in 2004. That's what I thought. Okay. And then um, got her master's in urban planning from the University of Buffalo um, and has kind of worked her way up uh, at Modern Disposal Services. And now she's the operations manager, um, knows tons about recycling. And I'm very excited to hear has to say about that today. She gave a talk a Bergen form a few years ago, um, but uh, I think she's probably got much more to say now. And um, so I'm pleased to introduce Fenna. At the end, we will take questions um, probably first from Rune Lecture Hall and then from Zoom. Okay, so um, I'll turn it over to, to, to Fenna. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. You have to share screen and then start from the beginning. Okay. Hello. Nicole's jumping up. She's going to help me. Oh, it is. Uh, yes, I press play. I am so glad to be here with all of you and with all of you on Zoom. And thank you, Michelle, for inviting me. And thank you to uh, Nicole and Trina and Shannon who helped me get here. And I have 11 slides today. I am gonna cover some basics about recycling. And then I will touch on national sword and plastics and glass. And then hopefully we have ample time for questions. So why should you recycle? Recycling conserves resources, recycled material, um, replaces virgin material, which we do not have an infinite amount of. And recycling, at least the first part of it, has to happen locally, so it does create jobs in your community. And so simply put, recycling is taking something old and making something new. And so to do this, First, you have to collect it, the material, and then you have to sort it. And that's the section where I'm the operations manager is at the sorting part. And Modern does both collecting and sorting. And then we sell it to the mill, which is what people normally think of as recycling, where they break it down and then make a pellet or a roll or something new. And they sell it to a factory and then make it into a recycled product. And so recycling only works if there is a demand for the new product. You buy something that has recycled content in it, you as an individual or you in our construction and you know our larger projects, um, that creates continued demand and that material demanded can be recycled and new items are made from the old ones. If we are not purchasing recycled content products, then the rest of it can't happen. It can't, you can't close the loop. And so that's why it's important for you as a consumer to know, you know what materials are in the packaging particularly and to demand for post-consumer, specifically post-consumer recycled content. And so that's how we recycle. And what we recycle, we have changed our menu from these things are recyclable to these are the best items to recycle. Um, they have the traditional paper and glass, cardboard, metal, and plastics. But for example, in plastics, we're highlighting ones and twos, uh, PET and HDPE as the best items to recycle. What's not recyclable, not all metal is recyclable, just like your aluminum and your soup cans. Please, please do not put aerosol cans, propane tanks, batteries in your recycling. Um, and that also includes electronics because electronics have batteries in them. 
and they do cause fires and we do have fires at the plant. None of ours have burnt down our building yet, but every year I get several articles about recycling buildings that burn for days before they're out. So um, fire hazards are a big deal for us and keeping them out of the recycling stream. Also, <clears throat> there are a lot of shafts in our operation. So Christmas lights, clothing, uh, plastic bag and film, all of those things, they just wrap around the shafts and they're an operational nightmare for us, in addition to not being recyclable. So, and also there are people who are in this process. And so we do ask that you don't put any medical waste in your recycling because people do have, are wearing gloves, but they are touching, handling the material. So recyclables are collected locally, but they have a global impact. And I just want to say, do not underestimate encouragement. I still want to encourage recycling. There are some discouraging things about recycling right now. And there's, people are talking about the discouraging things, but at the recycling plant, if you ever get to come visit me there, the pile of recyclables is huge. And we go through it every single day. And, you know, one account, one town can bring in maybe 40 tons on a rainy, dreary day that you don't want to put your cart out. And then that same account with the same number of stops can have 80 tons. Like you do make a difference. What you buy and taking the time to put it in the recycling does make a difference and it can become something new. So I just wanna emphasize the encouragement part and spreading that. You all obviously are interested in recycling, but if you can spread that encouragement, that is very helpful. So National SWORD um, began in 2017. It is the Chinese government enforcement of policies um, to stop the importing of trash and um, developing in-country recycling. This is the public accepted narrative. <laughs> and so um, what happened when they did this, it halted the flow of 13 million paper tons a year and almost a million plastic tons annually. This is how much recycling we sent to China. And that's not counting all the recycling that Europe sent to China. And so, um, and I couldn't find the statistic, but recycling is, was our third or fifth largest export to China from the US. And so it's big business. And when they started, when the government started enforcing these policies, many of them already existed. This was about strict enforcement. I think there were maybe some new policies, but mostly it was about enforcement. And so it stopped the flow of everything because businesses had to figure out, oh, what are we going to have to, you know, what's going to work and not going to work. Um, and then some of that flow did start back up. Um, but it was tentative because in 2013, the Chinese government had done something similar. It was called Green Fence, where they tried to restrict trash flow into the country. But after a few months, the paper mills said, okay, that's nice, but we don't have any feedstock. We can't print a newspaper, we can't, we're not gonna be able to make anything out of paper if you don't open up the flow of fiber into the country again. And so the government relented and things went back to normal. And so this time in 2017, you know, things started maybe in February or something. And I think it started hitting the newspapers in the fall. It took a while for people to decide okay, this is not gonna go away. And so, um, and because it took that long for businesses to decide, okay, we're gonna have to adjust, then it takes another you know, nine to 18 months for businesses to 
react and to put in capital to open up new paper mills because that's a lot of money. So they're not going to do that unless they're going to be able to recoup it. So they had to wait to decide, okay, we're going to have this continued opportunity. And then they were able to open paper mills in the US that were previously mothballed. Um, but in all of this time, two years or so, there was a cost, smaller recycling handlers, smaller municipalities, some of them had to shut down, they had to stop collecting, they didn't have the cash to float um, this, you know, the financial trouble, and there were whole states or counties that just stopped recycling during that time. But there were some benefits. Uh, the quality of recycled material went up. Things that we thought were impossible actually were. Our paper at our plant, the paper that we produced, maybe had 20% trash in it. We never had to uh, measure it, so I don't know exactly. But then the Chinese government was asking for it to be at 3% contamination. That's a big jump. I said, that's never going to happen. <laughs> but we were able to clean it up a lot we're probably at five or 10% now. So it's, you know, a little bit above that, but it still cleaned up everything. And so that was a benefit for everyone, domestic and export markets. It also highlighted the importance of end markets to close the loop, that if you don't have China to buy everything, that we do have to actually make sure that we have end markets and made that part of the collective conversation and it made it okay to talk about recycling challenges. Before everyone just wanted to hear good things about recycling and that everything was working and possible. So plastics, plastics are getting a lot of attention these days. And National Sword did push out low grade plastics um, and they are just starting to recover right now since oil is coming up. Everything else had, has already sort of stabilized and been recovering, but film just started doing that. So your low grade plastics, you're talking about film, you're talking about like the yogurt containers, um, smaller plastics, these types of things. So, and one thing I've learned working at the recycling plant is the importance of scale, right? So at our plant, we make 10 loads of fiber a day. We barely make one load of plastic a day. And that's not even a single plastic. If I just add all of our plastics together, we maybe make one load a day to the 10 loads of fiber we make every single day. So plastics as it's tied to oil production and the climate change and things like that, that's significant. But the plastics role in recycling is not that, is not, you can't move the needle very much plastic. Even if you doubled the amount that you collected, it's still not the largest part of our stream. So, and lots of people recommend um, films or things for me to read or watch, and I don't get to all of them, but I did watch the story of plastics. They have both an animated short and a documentary film. And I would, if you have not seen it, I would really encourage you to watch it and to share it with your classes. Um, I think it really puts plastics into a con the, the broader context, not just the recycling part. And then for glass, so glass recycling does not accommodate cross contamination. We do single stream recycling or zero sort recycling. It has lots of names, but it's the one where you get to throw everything in together and then we sort it back out condense it and send it to a mill. And so when the shift in recycling moved to this type, it increased participation, it um, improved trucking efficiencies, but it also made there be more cross-contamination in the material, the bales that we make of paper and cardboard and plastic and stuff. So the glass has more contaminants in it. And for everything else, for the fiber and for plastic, that goes into a bath. And so you can have screens to help take out contamination. You can use density to take out contamination. Um, for metal, contamination can be burned off. 
but for glass when you melt it everything wants to stick to it and so it's a lot the engineering of it is not as straightforward and not as easy on a large scale so the situation that we are in is that we are required to collect glass in recycling as per New York state law. Um, as I said, there's an extremely limited market for single stream produced glass. It's mostly used in the landfill as an aggregate substitute. And recently the New York state DEC declared glass deposited in the footprint of the landfill that it cannot be reported as recycling. Which may be well intentioned, but did not give us any other option of where to put it. So <laughs> that's where we're at right now with glass. My mom likes to take my glass down here from Buffalo and she puts it in the source separated dump where you can put glass all by itself. And source separated glass can be recycled because it's clean. It's just single stream glass that doesn't have a viable large scale market right now. So National Sword did make it okay to talk about this, but this was a problem before National Sword. So people would start talking about plastics and paper and oh, and glass is a problem too, but glass never went to China. So, but the good news is that the New York State DEC is funding glass recycling research including a project projects I heard, heard today, um, directed by Dr. Gabrielle Gaustad. And there are research positions available for students and not just glass and engineering students. So if you're interested in getting involved in finding solutions, you should talk to her. So she's here today, <laughs> if you don't know who she is. And so, that's, I just wanted to, that's what I have to say. And I will open it up for questions. Michelle said to start in person. Uh, yeah, start with questions from the lecture hall. Okay. Yes. You repeat the question. Okay. Um, so the question was, oh, and we have a chat. Oh, okay. Um, the question is about the difference between source separated recycling and single stream recycling. Um, so source separated recycling is when nowadays, like here, if you have a, a dump or a transfer station where you go, and then you yourself, you throw your plastic into the plastic, you know, area, and then you're putting metal with metal with like metal, and you put glass with glass and paper with paper. That's very clean. And we used to do that in the collection trucks, right? You used to have to put your bag of paper out and your bag of cardboard out and your bag of metal out, right? Or your contain whatever containers you use. And those would go into a truck and the truck had to have separate compartments for each type of material. If one compartment got full, that whole truck had to go back to the yard to dump because heaven forbid, if you unsorted the things that people sorted out, they got very mad at you. So then you're shipping a whole, you're using gas to ship a whole bunch of air you know, um, to the plant and then back out onto route. I mean, cardboard is what would be the biggest, but even when they tried to make the cardboard one bigger than all the rest, sometimes it would still fill up. So it wasn't very efficient for trucking in addition. And so when you have all the material together, there can be a single body truck and you can compact the truck and you can get a lot more on the truck before it has to go back to the yard and you can get three or four times as much on the truck. So single stream made sense on a lot of different levels. It got, when you could throw everything together, more people did it. Before, only people who are really avid would go to all that trouble to sort everything out. 
And so that's part of the shift, but it just means that there's, you know, plastic in the paper and there's paper in the plastic. We, we sort at a gross level. It's not a detailed fine um, sort. So that's the difference. And there are places that have stuck with um, mostly rural places that have stuck with source separated material and they can get quite a premium for their um, product that they have to sell, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not to scale. It's mostly smaller places that do that. So any other questions in, yes? Yeah, so we have mechanical sorting, um, which we call screens. It's basically a shaft with a rotating star um, and they're sorting by size and shape. So for the cardboard, the stars are like yay big and they're this far apart and the cardboard surfs the top. On the paper screens, they're at an angle and the stars are only like this big and they're like this, but there it's on an angle. And so it's propelling flatter, lighter things up and then rounder, heavier things are rolling down. So let's say your recycling gets wet and the paper is heavy. It doesn't want to go up or, you know, when plastic bottles are so thin and you flatten them and then they're going to act like paper, right? And they're going to get thrown up with the paper. Um, and then, so we've got mechanical. We do have magnetic sorting. We use just a traditional magnet. And then there's also an eddy current um, that pulls out the aluminum at the end of the process. And then there's also optical sorting. And so it's a box that sits over the belt and it uses mirrors and lights. That's as much as I know. And it identifies the material, like, I don't know, at a molecular level. It, we have one that sorts out PET and it doesn't matter if it's a plastic water bottle or if it's a fleece, it says, okay, you're polyethylene terephthalate, we want you. And so it's not an x-ray machine. If the water bottle has a fancy label sleeve that's made from HDPE, it can't know that that's a PET bottle. Um, but once it identifies it, it says, okay, we know where on the belt you are and how long it will take to get to the end of the belt. And at the end of the belt, there's a lip with like small air valves, maybe two or 300 across. And it says, okay, we're gonna blow these four air valves. And then the water bottle or, you know, something gets blown over a wall. So everything else is being gravity fed. And then the plastic in this particular case gets blown over the wall. So if the water bottle has water in it, it's not strong enough to blow the water bottle over. Um, and then there's also manual sorting. And in the first part of the process, the manual sorters are double checking the work of the machine and taking out things that the machine selected that shouldn't be there. And at the end of the process, we do have one optical sorter for PET, but then for the other plastics, um, number twos and number fours and fives, people are manually pulling them off a belt and throwing them into a bunker in front of them. So, yes. Oh, Senna, can I interrupt here? Can you stop sharing your screen so those of us in Zoom land can actually see your face? Oh, yes, I can do that. Did that work? Okay, good. Yes. Oh, oh, Repeat she the question, asked, please. Repeat the question. Yes. She asked, um, what are the worst contaminants in the glass recycling? Um, when we sort out glass, we do it by size. It was, we had a shaker table and the glass, which is all broken up, would fall through these holes. And um, so other things that were the same size, I mean, pieces of ceramic, 
stone, plastic bottle caps, shredded paper. I mean, except for the ceramics, it's not anything that actually shouldn't be in the recycling. It's just a mechanical um, challenge, not, a, not that there was something, you know, put, that you shouldn't have even put in there, so. Yes. This is the encouragement I'm talking about. Continue. Um, he asked about accountability for a county or for someone who's collecting recyclables to actually take it to a recycling plant. Um, I do not know what type of municipal accountability there is from, I mean, I know that the DEC watches what we do and um, I know, for example, the town of Amherst try to encourage recycling of glass on site on a town property um, to so that it could be source separated and that then it could actually be recycled. Um, and instead of it coming into the stream that comes to us and the DEC, they got like a slap on the wrist from the DEC for trying to do that. Um, but that's a suburb in a city metropolitan area right like if a rural place is doing that is the DEC watching I don't know um, in terms of accountability for ourselves or other handlers um, number one the DEC is watching us but also we do produce annual reports I mean I suppose we could lie on them but we don't and but you can look those are public records you can see like how many tons of residual we had at our plant you can see how many tons of paper and plastic, the different kinds of plastic. So you could, um, you, you can see how many tons we received and all of that material is public record. So, yes. Oh. Um, I mean, a transfer station will bring it to a place, a sorting facility like ours. Oh, you mean the source separated at the source? Um, yes, they will some, I mean, like the, oh, the one here, I think is probably going through a broker, but yes, it, that material will go directly to a mill. Yes, yes, that's true. And I know, you know, sometimes for us as well, that's true that sometimes when people question our, you know, our good faith efforts, I mean, we spend all that money to collect it. I mean, we're going to try to recycle it. You know, in the menu, we have the best things to recycle and we have things that are not recyclable. And there's sort of this area in the middle. We're not saying you can't recycle it. We're just trying to be somewhat transparent that those things don't have a stable market. So plastics fours and fives don't have a stable market. Um, so, but it's in our interest to recycle it if we can and recoup some cost. Um, but it's just that when we don't have someone to sell it to, we can't do anything about that. Um, and also, you know, the part about you making a difference public pressure or public, you know, public opinion matters. And so during National Sword, when we had paper, some plants stockpiled paper, some plants had to throw it away. I mean, it was, you, you just had too much paper. 
um, and accumulating and not any place to send it to. So we were lucky enough that we were, we were able to move our paper to mills to be recycled because having to potentially, you know, someone finding out that we were sending it to a landfill would be a PR nightmare. And so we actually paid for the paper to be recycled some of the time in order to avoid what you're talking about. <laughs> we couldn't sustain that for very long. Like we, we were getting paid for some of the paper, but some of our paper that we sorted, we had to pay for, for it to be recycled. Um, Fena, it, it, there's some questions on the chat, and also if you could repeat, if you could say what the question is before you answer it, because in Zoom land we can't hear the questions being asked. So. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, the first online question is, so should we only put plastic one and two in the bin? Um, that I, I put my fours and fives in my bin. Um, and I can tell you that we have been able to uh, move tubs and lids. This is like your sour cream containers or your yogurt containers, things like this. Um, there are four plants in the US that recycle those. So, um, when one of them goes down, it really disrupts the flow. <laughs> but so this is the part about it being uneven, but I still put them in. Um, other, other plastics you don't have so many of in your house, but you know, number three and number six and number seven, I wouldn't recycle, um, but we are glad to take it if you would like to send it to us. So that's that question. And then um, Hope asks, what would be the most effective driver of change in the realm of food packaging, which is increasingly and often unavoidably always in plastic? What are the most promising solutions to too much plastic packaging? I don't have a good answer to that question. Does anyone else in the room have an answer to that question? Yes. Um, so the answer in the audience was to talk about it more and to talk to your, um, she used an example of the food co-op in Buffalo, which would, you know, presumably be a progressive store. But when she brought up her desire not to use single use plastic, they were, they looked a little confused and didn't know what she was talking about. And so then, you know, you start that conversation with, you know, your local stores or your producers or expressing your desire to have less packaging or to not have single use plastic, plastic packaging. Um, and I will say this is related to that um, and supports that answer that you as a consumer do have a lot of power and influence in that sense, because right now HDPE plastic pr pricing is going up. Naturals, which is number two plastic without pigment is over a dollar a pound. It is so, it, I've never, it's, this is an incredible amount of money for that. And number two plastic with pigment, which we call colors, um, is also, uh, the value of it is being pressed, is getting higher. And that I have heard that that is because 
the very large, large companies are making these commitments to having post-consumer recycled content in their packaging. And so they're having to start making sure they have the feedstock to be able to meet those goals, those corporate goals. And so, yes, that's an answer to that question. And Zoom, so I should like find the people who ask these questions, but um, let's see. Another question is, should you put the plastic tops back on plastic bottles before recycling them, recycle the tops separately or put the tops in the trash and why? Okay, so plastic lids or tops um, are, the bottle caps in particular are too small for our machine to handle. And so they just fall through and they get swept up and thrown away. So to increase the chances of that bottle cap being recycled, most bottle caps are HTP, HDPE number two plastic. So if you were very dedicated, you could put it in your laundry detergent bottle or something that's HDPE. So that same plastic is with same. Um, if you wanted to do something, but not quite that much, you could leave it on the bottle. If that PET bottle most likely goes to a large processor, if they're large enough, they have an incentive to reduce their trash costs. And so they will take the scrap HTPE that they don't want. Most plastic plants either do number two or number one mills. They're not usually doing both. But if they're large enough, they have an incentive to collect the number two and then send it someplace to be recycled rather than it going to the trash. Um, but if it's a small place, it'll still end up in the trash. And so, um, but lids like on the sour cream containers and such are usually the same plastic. So those should be attached to the tub so that it doesn't, it's not loose and doesn't get lost in the jumbling of the system, so. And, oh, has the pandemic affected recycling efforts by local people as well as at your end? Um, when the pandemic first started, a lot of the commercial recycling um, was cut off. So that reduces the cardboard we were receiving because the stores were shutting down and everything. And there was an increase in residential recycling that you could see because more people were at home and consuming things at home and then recycling them as opposed to their office building, which may or may not have recycling, um, you know, depending on where they work. So we did see that effect. And then um, also there has been a lot more small cardboard because people are buying things online more in the industry, they call it the Amazon effect. And so I told you about the screen being the cardboard, you know, rye surfing the top, but that's for big cardboard. So the little cardboard just falls through and it's not actually like a, a match for that. It ends up into the paper, but there was more smaller cardboard, so. And should we clean glass containers? Oh, cleaning. Cleaning anything is not particularly necessary on our end. It may be necessary for your spouse or partner or your household happiness, but it is not necessary for us. Um, it is necessary for, to, for things to be empty. You know, you don't want, you want the weight to be correct. Things are sorted by the weight of the package. So you don't want there to be liquid in there or like so much honey you would never waste that kind of honey, but you don't want so much in there that it makes the package a different weight. Um, but otherwise it doesn't have to be clean. So, um, and, oh, just a comment that Wegmans is not that responsive in this area. Um, I mean, your particular Wegmans might not be responsive, but Wegmans as a whole is, you know, they're interested in their public relations around recycling. Um, so 
the plastic bags that you recycle, um, like the ones that you take to those in-store bins, they have a contract to turn those plastic, the single-use plastic bags into their reusable bags. And, you know, plastic bags are very hard to recycle, um, but they, because they're large enough and they can demand that, they, and they have an end use for it, they have a place to take those single use plastics and turn it into something that they can control that there's going to be a demand for it. And so I know that they're somewhat responsive. Um, I'm sure that there are limitations to that, but. And can you say anything about recycling of organic material? Oh, so organics recycling is coming. It's just a matter of when. Massachusetts has no more landfill space. They have to send their trash to Pennsylvania or Ohio, everything, every single, I, I think they might have one incinerator. They might have one incinerator in Massachusetts, but almost all of their trash is leaving the state. And so there is a lot of recycling in Massachusetts. And this has to do with economics, right? So when, if a recycling processor, if it, if it costs us 80 or $90 to process your recycling, and it costs in Massachusetts about 80 or $90 to process your recycling, right? But in Massachusetts, trash is $120 a ton or $150 a ton, then 80 or $90 sounds really good. But when you're in Western New York and trash only costs 30 or $50 a ton, then $90 a ton is twice that much, right? So it may take a while. In, in Massachusetts, you cannot put any recycling in the trash. You cannot put any food. They have very strict food, um, like food source recycling for uh, you know, stuff from a grocery store or something like that. And then also, they also have residential organics recycling. Um, and you will get fined if you put any of that stuff in the landfill trash garbage stream. So we are not close to that in New York State, but it will eventually happen. And there is the New York State DEC put in a new organics law that started or starts soon, maybe in January, but it's only for large processors or producers. So you're talking about your Wegmans and your grocery stores and University of Buffalo. And I don't know if Alfred University falls in that category, but there is a law going into place for very large producers of food waste and saying what you have to do with that food waste, that you have to try to get it to someone that can consume it, that you have to try to get it to a farm where it can be fed to animals, that you have to try to get it to a digester instead of it going to the landfill. Um, so eventually they will work their way down and it will eventually make it to the residential level. So, okay. Um, the question was about construction waste. Um, I don't handle that at the recycling facility and that's not likely something that we will um, handle at the recycling, the residential recycling plant. I do know when I said the thing about scale, I learned about scale, you know, one load of plastic to 10 loads of paper a day. There's a lot of focus on residential recycling and it is a large stream. But construction, I mean, construction produces a massive amount of waste. And so, you know, if you're a student and you're interested in maximizing, you know, material recovery of all of the goods that we consume and produce, not just as individual consumers, construction, there is a lot of opportunity in that area. And much of the construction recycling that happens only happens when there is a law that makes it happen or or if you're a company that wants some sort of lead certification and then you have the incentive to pay the extra money to do the sorting on site in order to recycle materials
Any other questions in? Yes. There's not a way to recycle them through us currently. We'll take them. We still take, we'll take all of your glass, but we don't have a market. And one thing I will say about that is that sometimes, you know, if you have a group like this that's engaged and will educate themselves, like it's okay to say, you know, we're not recycling that right now. But for some people I meet maybe at a, you know, at a street fair or something, if that's the only thing they're gonna think about for the next 20 years, I will still tell them to recycle glass, not because I'm lying, but because, you know, we're gonna find a solution. And then I want that person to be putting it in their recycling. So when we find, you know, they're not gonna know that we figured something out and we can do it better now, you know? So it is hard to, ch behavioral change is hard. So keeping people on the path of having the flow available even if there are challenges is still worthwhile. And so, and we're ending at 110. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? So that's in two minutes. Um, I will just say that I was a Bachelor of Arts in Fine Arts student. <laughs> and, um, and then I was, I was interested in public art and museums and the interface of community and art. And so I took that to the next sort of in the direction of the community part afterwards and I got a master's in urban planning. And while I was applying for jobs, urban planning jobs, I thought, let me do some temp work. I didn't actually know what I was getting myself into. I thought I would spend like one week in this factory and three days in this factory and, you know, eight days in this factory. And I thought, well, I'll get some cash and I will get to see the biggest employers in Buffalo while I'm applying for planning jobs. And that's not how that worked. I got placed at the recycling facility as a sorter. I was pulling out the milk jugs that are so valuable now. And I worked long hours and I was very tired afterwards. <laughs> and so um, that was unexpected, but I very much enjoyed it. And it was a good contrast to grad school and I liked the immediate gratification. But then I, they taught me how to run machinery and that was a lot of fun. And then um, eventually they pulled me into the scale and the office and then I was uh, promoted to manager. So it was a different path. That's how I got to where I am now. Thank you for sharing that with us. I think that's a really good story. Um, so I want to thank uh, Fena very much. That was a really illuminating talk. And especially, I'm glad you left a lot of time to ask questions for us to ask you questions because a lot of people have questions on these things. Um, uh, so thank you, Fena. And just really quickly, next week's speaker uh, will actually be our youngest speaker this semester. It will be Nathaniel Grove who is a uh, junior in, uh, at Amherst College, and he'll be talking to us about uh, Alaskan glaciers. So uh, once again, uh, virtual and actual applause for Fena. And uh, um, hopefully we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Oh. You got to the recording. Okay.